could easily study history at high school or college without ever hearing that a king or queen was LGBTQ. And you could travel around the world looking at castles and palaces without ever hearing that the ruler who built them was LGBTQ. But how surprising is it that some of the world's most fabulous palaces were built by royals who had what we call the queer eye? Several of the rulers I'm going to talk about are called the Great or the Conqueror. These are big monarchs. In fact, I'm kind of starting with Alexander the Great, who certainly had same-sex relations, but I'm not going to talk about Alexander, but rather his father, Philip II of Macedon. It was Philip who developed the military tactics that made Macedonia into a great power, conquered all of mainland Greece, and was planning the invasion of the Persian Empire. But then he died. So the big invasion of Persia was carried out by his son and chief general, Alexander. But it was Philip who built the impressive palace at Ai in northern Greece, modern Vergina near Thessaloniki. This was the largest building in the ancient world. It was all faced in shining marble so that when a ship came up to northern Greece, they could see in the distance the gleam of this building. Not very much remains of it, as you can see. I'm showing you both the ruins and a reconstruction of what it looked like in ancient times. But you can actually visit something really cool nearby, which is Philip's tomb. Because despite the efforts of grave robbers, we seem to have Philip's tomb, with a gold urn for his ashes and also a beautiful gold crown that was buried with him. Like his son, Philip had male lovers. But the story is hard to tell because both of the boyfriends we know about had the same name, Pausanias. Also, it's a big bloodbath. There was, in effect, a catfight between Pausanias I and Pausanias II. Pausanias I insulted Pausanias II's masculinity. So he went and got himself killed in battle to show what a big man he was. And then Pausanias II's powerful friend, to take revenge, had Pausanias I gang-raped by their slaves. This is not sophisticated Athens, it's backcountry Macedonia, so things were done in crude ways. In any case, Philip didn't avenge Pausanias I's honor, so he assassinated Philip in the stadium of the palace that we're looking at. All right, we go on to ancient Rome, where a number of the Caesars had same-sex relations of various kinds. Julius Caesar, for instance, was called by his troops, quote, the husband of every wife and the wife of every husband, end quote. So, there are many possible cases I could talk about, but probably the most famous are Nero and Hadrian, both of whom were also huge builders. We all know Nero because he supposedly fiddled while Rome burned. True, Nero liked to sing and play the lyre, and true, Rome burned, but there is no connection. Nero got blamed for the fire in the popular imagination because he behaved insensitively after it taking a big chunk of the burned area, by what we would call eminent domain, and building a huge palace on it. Rome is famously on seven hills. Nero took parts of three of the hills and the valley in between them and built this gigantic palace called the Domus Aurea, the Golden House. Nothing remains of it on the whole because all the emperors after him wanted to show that they weren't big megalomaniacs like Nero, so they gave most of the area back to the public in the valley where Nero had a private lake, for instance, they, are, uh, they built an amphitheater, which we call the Colosseum. There is actually a little piece of the Domus Aurea that you can visit rather deep underground. These are ruins underneath a couple of other layers of ruins of buildings, which later Romans built on top of them. But they were rediscovered in the Renaissance, and their decoration, which was well-preserved, inspired a lot of Renaissance art. Again, Nero had same-sex relations. There are so many bizarre rumors about Nero that it's hard to tell what's true, but there is one about a male lover that, as a historian, I am quite sure is, at least broadly, true, although certainly bizarre, both by our standards and ancient Roman standards. That is, that there was a slave called Sporus who looked like Nero's dead, dead first wife, Papaya Sabina. So he had Sporus castrated, and married him with a full marriage ceremony. The reason I say this is true is that Sporus outlived Nero. He was kind of passed on from warlord to warlord as a kept boy for a while, 
Not very long for him, sadly, he ended up being forced to commit suicide. So we move on to a much nicer story, to Hadrian, famous for things like Hadrian's Wall. But he also famously had a boyfriend, a guy named Antinous, whom he had declared a god when Antinous died. And consequently, there are about 150 statues and busts of Antinous in the world today, so we know what he looked like, at least in an idealized form. Hadrian also built a lot. Indeed, we are told that he designed some of his buildings, which could be true, or at least partly true. In Rome, he built the Pantheon and the Castel Sant'Angelo, which was originally his family tomb. He also built himself a gigantic villa in what's now the town of Tivoli, about an hour from Rome. I highly recommend visiting. It's a gigantic ruin. Just to give you an idea, the royal villa at Tivoli was bigger than the city of Pompeii. And one of the things in it was a temple to the divine Antinous. Many of the statues of Antinous that are in Rome today probably came from the temple in Tivoli, and you can uh, see the base of the temple when you visit the villa. Moving on in time, we're going to go outside the West. There are also a lot of rulers in non-Western cultures that have had same-sex relations. In China, for instance, Emperor Ai Han, who ruled about the time of Jesus Christ, gave a name to at least male homosexuality. It's called the love of the cut sleeve in Chinese, from a story in which Ai Han, not wanting to disturb his sleeping lover, cut off his sleeve when he had to get out of bed. But there were rulers with same-sex relations in many cultures. One who is very important historically is the Ottoman Turkish Sultan Mehmed II, usually called Mehmed the Conqueror, because he's the person who took uh, so-called Constantinople and put an end to the Byzantine Empire. Mehmed II built a huge palace, which today is called Topkapi, famous, among other things, for its appearance in the movies. Again, this is something you, that you can visit. And you can visit the harem, where, at least in Mehmed II's time, there were male sex objects as well as women. But he also had love affairs with aristocratic boys. One of his great favorites was from Wallachia, which is part of Romania today, a guy called Radu the Fair. But Radu the Fair was the younger brother of someone much more famous, Vlad the Impaler, then the ruler of Wallachia. Their family name was Dracul. Vlad was famous for appalling cruelty, and as this all took place just after the invention of the printing press, he became the subject of the first bestseller in Europe, and ultimately the basis of the Dracula legend. I bet you never guessed that Dracula had a cute younger brother. <laughs> the Ottomans' big enemies at this time were the Safavids, the rulers of Persia. And one of their greatest rulers too, Abbas the Great, had a taste in young men. This was actually typical of Muslim cultures around the Mediterranean at this time. There was a lot of poetry and also art about beautiful youths. We have a beautiful painting, which I'm showing you, of Shah Abbas flirting and or snuggling with a young man pouring his wine. This is just the kind of thing that shows up in the poetry. And Shah Abbas was also a great builder. He moved the capital of Persia to Isfahan and built an amazing complex centering on one of the world's largest squares called the Maidan. There's a huge, complicated and ornate palace called the Alkapu with terraces looking out over the square so you can watch the entertainments. And there are two absolutely gorgeous, beautifully decorated mosques on the Maidan with the glowing blue tiles for which Isfahan is famous. So now we come back to Europe to talk about one British, one French, and two German kings before returning to one last Asian ruler in India. The British king is James I, the man who commissioned the King James Bible. James had quite a series of what are called favorites. Probably the most fun is the young man I'm showing you now, called George Villiers, the Duke of Buckingham. Villiers was famous for dancing, and he sure had the legs of a dancer. James met him at a court fete where he fell and hurt himself while dancing, and James personally took care of him, and ultimately, to make a long story short, appointed him to a dukedom, which is a big thing. He was the only duke at the time not related to the royal family, so it's kind of like Antinous becoming a god. 
James was not as big a builder as the other kings I've been telling you about, but there are a couple of palaces you can see that are associated with James. One is this building I'm showing you, called the Banqueting House on Whitehall in London. It is the only remaining part of what was the big palace of the Tudor and Stuart kings, Whitehall Palace, which burned down. The Banqueting House was a wing built for James I by the architect Inigo Jones, who brought neoclassical architecture to England. And it's a fascinating place. Lots of historical things happened here. This is where Pocahontas and John Smith came to meet the king, James I, and also where his son, Charles I, was executed in the revolution in mid-17th century Britain. The scaffold was right outside, and he walked out those windows you're seeing. Another is Apthorpe Palace. Apthorpe did not belong to the royal family. It was the house of a great noble family, but there were a number of lengthy state visits and a suite of rooms built for the monarch. This was how nobles competed, by throwing big entertainments for the king. And Apthorpe was a, a special favorite of James's. And it is where he met George Villiers. In fact, when the building was restored recently, the archaeologists discovered a secret passage between the state bedroom where the king slept and Villiers's rooms, which is a lovely little bit of same-sex archaeological evidence. Next, I'm going to talk about somebody who was not a king, but rather the king's brother. I mentioned uh, Louis XIV and Versailles. This is Louis's brother, Philippe d'Orléans, known in France at the time simply as Monsieur. Monsieur lived in a gigantic palace right across the street from the Louvre called the Palais Royal, the Royal Palace. It's such a big complex that it contains all kinds of things. Today, it is mainly the seat of the Conseil d'État, the Council of State, an important government body. But the, it also contains the theater of the Comédie Française and also Paris's oldest restaurant, Le Grand Véfour. It is particularly famous for its gardens, which I'm showing you now. Philippe also had a huge castle outside Paris at Saint-Cloud, but uh, it was sadly destroyed by the Germans in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. Philippe, like all royals of his time, was married. In fact, he founded the Orléans dynasty, sort of France's alternate royal family. But as viewers of the TV series Versailles know, he had male favorites. Sodomy was severely punished at the time, and Louis XIV occasionally tried to interfere with his brother's love life. But it's fascinating how he more or less got away with being what we would call gay, even occasionally gender-bending, in a time when it was a capital offense. Apparently not if you were the king's brother. Now, we're going to talk about a couple of German kings. This spectacular palace was built by a king called again the Great, Frederick the Great of Prussia. Frederick is generally called Great because of his military victories. Prussia had a lot of great military leaders, but it was Frederick who made Prussia into one of the great powers of Europe. And sadly for him, in the long run, this led to his being greatly admired by Hitler two centuries later. So he's kind of vanished from public consciousness now. But what's cool about Frederick is not his military victories, but rather his cultural side. He was an intellectual and a musician, even a composer. In fact, in one of these paintings, Frederick is playing the flute with a group led by C.P.E. Bach, the son of Johann Sebastian Bach, who was his court music master. In the other, he's having dinner with a group of leading intellectuals, including Voltaire, who, in fact, lived in Frederick's palace for a time. You might notice, however, that there are no women at the table. In fact, Frederick only allowed men in Sans Souci, his palace, uh, which he named Free of Care, and which you can visit today. It's in Potsdam, an easy day trip from Berlin. Frederick's life centered on men. Certainly, he had no sexual relations with women. He did have a queen, but he only saw her once a year when he paid her a formal visit. And he had a bunch of different relationships with men, which look to us like probably romantic and or sexual ones. They also clearly looked that way to his father. When Frederick was young, he tried to desert from the army and flee to England, and his father decided to view this as treason. He didn't execute his son, although he threatened to, 
but he did have the buddy with whom he tried to flee beheaded in front of him. I've always thought of this little building as a monument to his executed buddy. It's the so-called Temple of Friendship in the Garden of Sans Souci, and all around it you see these big medallions on the columns. These depict famous pairs of Greek heroic buddies, Achilles and Patroclus, Theseus and Perithous, and so forth. Of course, from classical Greece on, these buddy pairs were also generally regarded as lovers, so it is probably also a monument to Frederick's sexuality. Our last European monarch is Ludwig II of Bavaria, known not as the Great, but rather as Mad Ludwig. Ludwig was a good-looking guy. His cousin, who was his best friend, Empress Sisi of Austria, was also famously beautiful. And they were also both really bad at ruling. Ludwig was a dreamy, sensitive boy, and he wouldn't really have anything to do with being king when he became king. But what he would do as king was build. He had lots of money. By that time, the state and royal pockets were separate, but the royal pocket was deep. And he built huge castles, including this famous one, Neuschwanstein, on which Walt Disney based Snow White's castle. Neuschwanstein is pseudo-medieval, or Wagnerian, but he also built two huge Versailles-like neoclassical palaces as well. And he built a lot of other things, including, for instance, Wagner's theater at Bayreuth. In fact, frankly, Wagner might almost be unknown today, except that one of his big groupies was King of Bavaria. And uh, if you read their letters to each other, Ludwig was clearly in love with Wagner, and Wagner was certainly at least playing along with it. It's actually hard to say how far it went. Ludwig had relationships like this with several other guys. I'm showing a picture of another prince, Paul von Thurn und Taxis, very handsome guy, and Ludwig's bestie when he was young, and also very involved with Wagner, for whom he did some singing. And then Ludwig turned on him. Von Thurn und Taxis said something or did something wrong. Ludwig would never tell him what he'd done, but the poor prince's letters to Ludwig are desperately emotional. Again, it's hard to say if they were actually lovers or not, but the emotions were all there. Sadly, this story did not end well. I don't think anyone cared about Ludwig's sex life, if he had one, but he was a total failure as king. Ultimately, the government more or less imprisoned him in his fabulous palace on what today is called the Starnberger See, and then he died. It's one of those mystery deaths. We don't know what happened. Maybe he was trying to escape and was shot, but there's evidence against that. It's very hard to say, but he died in the lake. And there's a cross, which I'm showing you where he died. I'm just going to close with one more royal, one who's alive today and whom I've actually met, a wonderful man in India called Manvendra Singh Gohil. Manvendra is the only son of the Mar Maharaja of Rajpipla, a principality in Gujarat which you have probably never heard of. But it has some fabulous palaces, built just over a hundred years ago by Manvendra's great-grandfather, who was one of those Maharajas who could easily show up at a hunt in Downton Abbey. But the great thing about these palaces for us today is what Manvendra has done with one of them. Manvendra came out publicly in 2006 and was publicly disowned by his family. All that has settled down now, but four years ago, he opened a 15-acre section of one of these palaces as a refuge for the LGBTQ plus community. Originally, it was a place for a community of a kind of trans people called hijras that are traditional in India, but it's become a more general LGBTQ plus center. I'm not sure which palace in Rajpipla this is in, so I'm showing you a few of them. Maybe the next time I see Manvendra, I'll ask. But anyway, I hope you've enjoyed your tour of the 10 gayest monarchs of history and their fabulous palaces.